got other folks that are out of town, and that's all good. Give the band a thank you this morning for being here this morning. Bryce is uh, Brad, who is a orchestra teacher up in Plano, is playing drums today because Bryce and his wife and family are off to East Texas to visit uh, Aaron's family, or uh, his wife's family over there. So we let them go, and Brad, I, we let Brad know to come in and play, and we're thankful. Uh, it's just so nice to have people that are connected because uh, Zach, who is our bass player and has been for a, a number of years, works at a school. He's the band director, and he knew Brad. Brad was the orchestra director, and he plays drums, so it's a good thing. It's all good, 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 good. So I'm happy, and I'm always happy to have Missy here. Missy and Keith, who are here with me every Sunday morning early to make sure that all the sound is set up and everything's doing well. That's good, good, good. Did everybody get checked in? Good, 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 good. Well, let's take a look. We've got a couple of scriptures up here about giving today. I love this. This is a mirror of a scripture that most of you know that are in the New Testament, but this is found in the Old Testament. It actually says, give generously and do so without a what? Come on, you can help me read. Without a what? Grudging heart. Then, because this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. Everything you put your hand to. God said he will bless. And then let's take a look here. This is the mirror of that same scripture that Paul wrote in Corinthians. He says, each man should give what he has decided his heart to give, not reluctantly or compulsion, because God loves a what? Cheerful. Cheerful giver. That means that every time you give, you should smile. Makes the devil really mad. Why? Because he doesn't want you getting blessed. We give because this scripture right here. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. That's our example. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So let's thank the morning. Let's thank the Lord this morning that we have an opportunity to give and to worship him with our giving. I know I'm thankful. Uh, we had a situation uh, this week that I uh, had to consult our our CPA on, you know, your pastor watches over the finances of this church like a hawk. And we do everything to follow the IRS rulings, which is really good. Well, I don't know about you. How many of you bank at Wells Fargo? Anybody else besides me at the church bank? Okay, you know. Well, they've been under hot water again. They're getting ready. To, the feds have launched a suit against them because of unnecessary funds that they charge customers for a period from 19, from 2013 to 2020. I mean, this has been years ago. So the feds came in and did an audit and says, you need to pay all those people back. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? And when I put the check in the bank, I thought, this is really a good thing. Until I get a 1099 for all the interest that went on all that. Well, that interest would trigger the IRS. And I talked to my CPA and he says, that doesn't even concern you. Doesn't even concern you or the church. And I thought, that is so good because he'd already gotten a ruling from the IRS for us on that case. Because I don't want any interest. We don't want any interest coming in. And my CPA said, so you don't have any secret CDs or monetary funds? I said, no. I said, we are a cash operation only. So that's a good thing. So let's take a look up here. Uh, one of the things that we do here at Crossroads, for those of you who are new to us, we give through a giving app. And every year at the end of the year, what will happen is they actually send you a contribution report, and I send you one as well. And that's the best way to do it. So if you want, oh, back up. Uh, this little QRL, all you have to do is take a picture of it, and it'll take you right to the website and uh, have my picture there to let you know that it's actually going to the church and have our church logo there. That's actually what it will look like right there when you see it on your phone. So let's take a moment. Let's just thank the Lord. You know what? As we give this morning, that he will do exactly what he said he would do. He said that he would multiply our seed sown. So Heavenly Father, right now, in Jesus' name, we thank you that we have an opportunity to worship you with our tithes and offerings. You have been faithful, faithful, faithful to watch over us, to provide for us, our health, our protection. You have done all these things. And so in Jesus' name, it's very easy to worship you with our tithes and offerings. 
You provide us 100%, and all you ask is that we worship you with our tithes, that holy portion of our income, our tithe. So, Heavenly Father, we worship you with that now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen and amen. Well, happy Easter to everyone. Happy, happy, happy. Did you wake up this morning? We're just jumping up and down and excited that it was cloudy outside and not raining. I was glad that it was just not raining. That's, that, that was for me. But I'm glad it's Easter Sunday. I'm glad it's Easter Sunday. Uh, I was thinking about it this last week and the fact that in 1974, I married into a family. I'd already been uh, in ministry with Oral Roberts for two years, was traveling with him for two years, those of you who remember him. And when I was married, we right, went right into ministry. As a matter of fact, there were 2,200 people at our wedding. Uh, if, how many? Some of you would remember Pat and Shirley Boone. They were at our wedding. Lots of people were there. We had about 2,200 people who we were married in Houston at Evangelistic Temple there. And we started in ministry right then. So on May 16th of 1974, flash forward these many years, and coming up, it will have been 50 years being in ministry. 40 of those years, 45 of those years have been ministry in this city as a pastor. Had a big church in North Dallas for many, many years. And then it started this one back in 19, oh no, 20. 2001, so we're 23 years old this year. And I'll tell you something. I love pastoring. I love you. Most of those of you who've known me for a long time know that I will work you and send letters to you and emails to you no matter what to try to get you going. Right, Kay? Kay will tell you that, too. All that to say, I believe that we all have a responsibility to ourselves to come to church because the Bible says that it's important for us to gather together. And that was one of the things I, I hated about the pandemic was the fact that we all stayed at home, all watched. And I don't mind doing it on TV, and Alex will tell you that. Uh, Alex, how big is our website with all of our videos? As far as total views, um, well, I think we're getting like over two million. Two million views. So it's on all the videos everywhere. Yeah, all of them combined. So all of that to say, whether we be big here has never been an important factor for me because I know like Daniel saw us on video and that's the reason why he's here. But there have been a lot of people whose lives have been changed simply because we're on video. And one of the nicest things about it is I've known Alex for, I hate to say it, probably 40 40 of those years, 45 of those years. Yeah. And uh, those of you that don't know Alex, you need to get to meet him because he's got what, five? Five Emmys. Five Emmys to his account. And wow. he is he is a good guy and watches over our media and uh, our weekly our weekly broadcast that goes out through YouTube or, or Facebook. So I'm just thankful for that. But I was thinking about Easter again. And I'll tell you something, if you've never had to speak before, trying to come up with a new angle on a message that has been spoken about, preached about, talked about for 20, 2,024 years has been pretty difficult. But I'll tell you something, I got a new twist on this. And what I want us to do is, I want us to think about and read about that very first Easter morning, that very first one. So what I want us to do is, we're going to read this uh, I'm going to put it up on screen. This is the John version of that first morning. It says, early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb to visit where Jesus had been buried. She found the huge stone had been rolled away from the entrance. It goes on to say, so she ran and found Peter and John, two of the disciples. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and I don't know where they put him. So the assumption is, that there were grave robbers, that there were grave robbers there. Now let me back up, I want to see if I uh, read over something. No, I didn't. Okay, we'll see it here in a second. So they found him, so she goes back and she tells the story. So then Peter and John ran to the tomb to see for themselves. John got out of the tomb first, got to the tomb first. He saw the linen burial cloth lying there. What's the next word? 
folded. Now I want you to think just for a moment. If you were a grave robber, would you take the time? Now first off, we've got to remember that there were these centurions that were on the outside of the tomb that somehow fell asleep, knocked out, whatever. Tomb stone was rolled away, and they don't know how long they have because other soldiers may be coming, but yet they took time to take the body of Jesus and folded his clothes. I want you to just think about that. Would you have taken the time to do that? And what would it look like if you're running away with a body with nothing on it? But yet these clothes were folded right there where he had laid. Let's read on. Then Peter arrived and went inside. And he also noticed the linen wrapping lying there, the cloth that had covered Jesus' head. When John saw this evidence, everybody say evidence. When John saw this evidence, he believed. For up until this point, the disciples still had not understood the scriptures that said Jesus would rise from the dead. I just can't imagine carrying a naked body around. And I can't imagine them taking the time to fold neatly that it would be noticed and left there. So what happened here? Well, the thing that I find very interesting, it says that when they saw this, the evidence, when John saw the evidence, he believed. If I'm back up here, don't run too far. So the whole point is, is that I want you to think about how daring is that? And that's the title of my message this morning, is Daring to Believe. Let's take a moment, let's pray before we get into the Word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it's through you and your revelation that we have life today, that we can believe. So Heavenly Father, as we worship you this morning, Father, we ask that your word become alive to us, breathe into us by your inspiration, your intent for us to learn and to grow this morning. So Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when I thought about this daring to believe, I thought also about the fact how many benefits there would be to us today if we did believe, if we really did believe. Well, I thought about 50, but we're not, I'm not going to give you all 50 today so you can kind of relax. We will get out of here before lunch. But I do have four of them. So let's talk about the first one. This is what I want you to take kind of and kind of pull in today. This is the most important scripture out of everything that I'm going to share with you today. This is what God wants you to do. Believe in the one he has sent. That's the most important thing, for you to believe that in the one that God has sent. So what is that first benefit, Pastor Bob? Let's take a look here. The four benefits of believing, and the first one is, everything I've done wrong is forgiven. When you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, everything that you have ever done, will do today, or into the future, has already been forgiven. Everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, every word that you spoke, every thought that you had, every, everything that you've ever done in your entire life, God has already forgiven all of that. I think that's a benefit. I think that's a benefit because first off, the wonderful thing about this is, is that God knew me, the Bible says, from the foundations of the world. That means he knew you too from the foundations of the world. It also says that he knows our last day on this earth. So he knows everything about us. And the good news is that when Jesus died, he covered all of that. Whatever we have done, will do into the future. The good news is everything I've ever done has been forgiven. I will tell you something. Being a pastor for as long as I've been, even if there wasn't a heaven, which there is, even if there wasn't one, the mere understanding from a clear conscience is to know that you have been forgiven. Whether you could go to heaven and, and spend eternity in heaven, just knowing that all of your sins are forgiven, that would be good enough for me. But the point is, God wants you to know that everything that you have done has already been forgiven. Look over here in Acts chapter 10 says, all who believe in Jesus will be forgiven of their sons through Jesus' name. All. 
all, everybody who has believed will have all of their sins forgiven. And again, Paul makes this statement over here in Romans. He makes a statement in Romans chapter 3, 22. He says, we are made right in God's sight when we trust in Christ, Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we all can be saved in the same way, no matter what we are, who we are, or what we have done. So it doesn't matter who you are. And that's one of the things that I like everybody to know, whether you're black, brown, green, polka dotted, speak Spanish, don't speak Spanish, Korean, whatever. It doesn't make any difference who you are, where you live, what you've done. Everything from your first breath till your last, your inspiration and expiration, all that you will ever have done is washed away, clean. You're like a little baby spiritually you have nothing to worry about because god has chosen to forgive you i think that's a powerful statement the second thing that he talks about is, is i learned god's purpose for my life that's a benefit you know i know a lot of people when they come when they when they finally have an awakening on the inside and they begin to wonder well why am i here what am i doing here what's my grand purpose in life i will tell you something outside of god you'll never know what your purpose is. You'll never know what your purpose is unless you know God because he's the one who put you here. The problem with most people is they don't want to spend the time to find out from God, why am I here? They don't find out, you know. They might think, well, I'm here to be, you know, like Jared, a police officer. I'm, I'm here to do this. I'm here like Robert to fly a plane. I'm, I'm here to, that's my purpose. That, no, God has a purpose in your life. Those are what you've chosen to do as your life's occupation, but that may be incorporated into that purpose. But until you stop and you ask him, God, what is your purpose for me on this life, on this earth? What, what am I supposed to be doing? You need to find out. People look within themselves and they try to figure out what that purpose is. And they just come up more frustrated than ever before because they can't come up with anything because they've not asked the right person. Prayer, reading your Bible, and taking a moment to say, God, I really want you to tell me what my purpose is. Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to be spending all of these days of my life? What kind of influence am I supposed to be on people's lives? What am I supposed to be doing with all that? You know, a lot of times people think when they introduce themselves to me, they'll say, hi, or I, I might say, I'm Pastor Bob. I don't say that when I'm just meeting people. But the very first thing they'll do, they'll tell me what they do for a living. Hi, my name's so-and-so, and, -so and I, this is what I do. But that's not who they are. It's not your identity. I don't know that anybody wants to be what they do. I want to be a child of God. That's my, po that's my point in life, is that I want to serve God with all my heart. That's what I want to be. Again, how do you find out who do you belong to until you really submit your life to God. Over here in Ephesians, let's take a look at these scriptures. Colossians first, Paul says, everything, everybody see everything. Everything, everything absolutely everything, got started in Christ and finds its purpose in Him. People want to know what their purpose is. If they don't know who God is and who Jesus is in their life, they'll never know what their purpose is. They'll never know that identity and that purpose. Paul says this over in Ephesians. He makes a statement here. He says, it is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Part of the overall, again, there's that word, purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone. He's working his purpose out in your life. The problem with most people is they never take a moment to take a beat, a breath, to find out, to ask. They don't. They just keep running through life, hopelessly finding just nothing but dead ends, and they want to know why. Unfortunately, in my line of work, I've met lots of people who said, would you come visit my cousin or my nephew or my uncle or my dad who's in the hospital and they're dying? And you get there, and they said, I don't even know why I'm here, why I've been here my whole life. And I think to myself, how sad is that? That you'll have lived your whole life and never known that God had a reason for you being here. I think that's sad. I hope that's not anyone here today. The third thing, the third benefit, I get God's strength for daily living. 
knowing that Jesus lives on the inside of me, I get certain strength out of that, and I know a lot of people do too. The point is that I don't believe that anybody can make it in this world without knowing that they have an inner strength that strictly comes from God. Strictly comes from God. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, can, the Bible says, can dwell in us. Over here in Isaiah, the Old Testament, he makes a statement here. He says, God gives power to those who are tired and worn out. How many of you have ever been tired and worn out? I have too. There have been days I've worked long hours when I was doing a lot of public speaking. Robert and Brian can tell you they were around. Missy would tell you that uh, there would be oftentimes Sundays I would be here with Missy and, and Keith early morning setting up, making sure that the theater's set up right, go through rehearsals, tech rehearsals, morning service, and I would pack, have my bags packed and I would run out to the airport because I would be on a five-day speaking trip. Week after week after week after week after week. <laughs> and there were days that I was exhausted, but there were days then that I could draw on that strength that was on the inside that only comes from God. The point is, is that he gives you that strength, that strength that we need when we know that without him, we're just sunk. Absolutely. Look over here in Ephesians. Paul makes a statement. I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him. I feel sorry for a lost and dying world because they don't have a clue and they work and 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 don't have anything. And I talk to people who are literally at their last bit of strength and you want to tell them, you know what, I've talked to you about Jesus. If you would just bring him into your life, your life would be a whole lot simpler, a whole lot easier, because you will have him. It is that same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. I just don't believe you can survive in this world without knowing who Jesus is. I just don't. The last one is that I think is the most important I'm guaranteed, everybody say guaranteed, guaranteed eternal life. I'm guaranteed eternal life. You know, when you, when you are a Christian, when you invite Jesus to come into your life, that life becomes God's. And that moment, you know, your physical body is going to die. This body, the Bible says, is dying daily. It's dying a little bit every day. It's wearing out. And we're getting closer and closer and closer to a heavenly walk. The thing is, I don't ever go to sleep wondering if what happens if I die in my sleep. I never worry about that. I know there are a lot of people that do. I know a lot of people that wonder what's going to happen to me. When if they would just turn to God, there would be such a peace that would come on the inside of them there would be that guarantee of eternal life. You know, when Jesus was born, born as a man, God come to earth, raised up, lived on this earth as a human being, 33 years, and then he died, crucified, laid in this tomb that we've read about, then something miraculous happened. And every one of you express it every time you put a date on anything. See, the moment that Jesus was raised from the dead, God split history. He split time. Because at that moment, everything B.C. before Christ, A.D. after his death, for that last 2,024 years, you have been writing dates. You have been recognizing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, whether you knew it or not. Everybody does. They are reverencing that moment that Jesus died and rose again. I think that's one of the most incredible things in the whole world. And there's nothing bigger than knowing that God is so big that he can actually Stop and separate time. 
when we die, I don't know, I've talked about it to some of the people here in the church before. I've been at the bedside when many unfortunate people have died not knowing God, not wanting to know God, which is even worse. They're at someone's invitation to be with them, hoping they would. And I just wonder what, what their eternity is like. Now, I know what the Bible says it's like. But when I think about heaven, I think about the vast domain that God has already created. And that place is going to be so beautiful, so beyond our wildest imaginations, our comprehension of what beauty is, is just so limited compared to what heaven's going to be like. And the fact that we are guaranteed eternal life in that environment, I think it's the most amazing thing on the most amazing thing. When Jesus rose from the dead, couldn't be found. For 40 days when he came back to earth immediately after that, he was there for 40 days. And I think this is one of the most challenging things for a lot of people is the fact that Jesus walked on this earth again a second time, made his appearance to several disciples on many occasions, went to parties. Matter of fact, there's one illustration in the Bible where he appeared to 500 people at the same time. How did 500 people not know that this is the guy that they just saw that was just crucified? And I think it'd be interesting. Jesus is appearing in Jerusalem all of this time. History tells us that. The Bible tells us that. And that's the reason why on 50 days after that, on the day of Pentecost when Peter was <coughs> preaching, that there were 3,000 people born in the church at one time because so many people had seen him. 40 days there, ascension, another 10 days. We had Pentecost, the church is born. But in that 40 days, he appears to a lot of people. I can just imagine he's walking down the streets of Jerusalem talking to some of his disciples, and there comes a centurion that put a spear into him. I imagine there was quite a quakening on the inside of him. What is this all about? We are guaranteed eternal life. I think that's outstanding. Jesus said over here in John, I am the one who raises the dead and gives them life again. What's the next word? Anyone anyone, anyone, bi, gay, straight, purple, pink, polka dotted, Spanish, English, anything, anyone who <laughs> believes in me, even though he dies, shall live again. He is given eternal life for believing in me and shall never perish. Shall never perish. Our bodies will decay and die dust to dust, but the good news is the spirit that makes us alive, animated, that's on the inside, that inspiration, that first breath, God breathing, breathing his life into us, that's the reason why we're animated. And we expire, we give that last breath out, that inspiration is gone, and then it's just, it's just a, a piece of clay that has held our friends. When that happens, we will live forever. This life is but a, like I've told people in the last few weeks, if you took a single grain of sand and compared it to all of the sand in the sea, that's 70 years, your, your little grain of sand, you can't imagine how long eternity is. And that's the reason why I tell people all the time, you know what, it's best that you just decide, what if, what if we're all wrong? Everybody in Christianity is all wrong. Will it have done us any bad for believing? The answer is no. But what if we're right and we spend all of those years in a heaven that's far beyond our wildest dreams? Look what he says over here. This is my favorite verse. We talked about it earlier. What does it mean for me to believe? What does it mean? I can turn everything over to God. All my disappointments in people, all of my hurt, my pain, my, you know, the future that I may be unsure of at moments, 
I can turn that over to God. I don't know the answers about what tomorrow brings, but I know that whatever it is, that he's going to take care of it. All of those things that we have on the inside, fears, sorrows, our victories, the triumphs that we have, all of that we can turn over to him. But here in Romans, Paul makes this statement. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is my Lord, and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, a lot of people, they go to church. A lot of people go to church because they believe. They do believe. You know, but they believe in their heart. They do believe in their heart. But they've never made that confession out loud that Jesus is Lord of my life. They've never <coughs> made that statement. I know people have gone to church all their, all their life. But that doesn't make them a Christian. It doesn't make them a believer any more than me going into the garage at my house and making me a car. It doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with it. But that confession of that mouth, that confession that says, you know, to someone that's listening far beyond our ability to hear, when we make that statement to him, you are my Lord. Jesus is the Lord of my life. I believe and I confess with my mouth that he is Lord of my life. That's what believing does. It changes my whole thinking about I can relax now and not worry about anything. I don't care about anything because I know that Jesus has got my every step monitored. He knows where every step is going to take me. So I'm going to ask you to do something a little different today. This is a prayer that I want us to pray together. Now you might have prayed a prayer similar to this when you for a child, an adult, doesn't make any difference. But if you went to church and you still believed on the inside, you thought about it, you know, think back, did I ever really say that Jesus was Lord of my life? Did I ever really say that out loud? You'll be able to say, you know what? On March 31st, 2024, I did say that. And I don't have to worry about it anymore. So I want us to pray this prayer out loud with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I open the door to my heart and I invite you to come in. Say it with me. Take control of the throne of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me from my sins and with my mouth I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Say it again. With my mouth I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Say it again. With my mouth, I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Heavenly Father, I just thank you right now because you heard everyone pray that prayer. And Father, if there was a person here that never said it before, they said it this morning. And today is a mark like that splitting in time for them. Yesterday was their whole life Today is the beginning of their new life, their new life with you. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you that it's a resurrection day for everyone here, that we can come together and we can confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of our life. So, Heavenly Father, I give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and amen and amen. You know what? I want, I, want, I want to thank every one of you for being here today because today, whether or not you recognize it, today there was a change in you going forward, a change going forward. You might have gone to church your whole life, but I will tell you, the moment that you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, there is no doubt. And I will tell you something, you will sleep really good tonight if you haven't been. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. I hope you all have a wonderful Easter. And uh, send me a plate of whatever you're having, and I'll be over right after we get done here. Okay. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. Give everybody a big squeeze before you go. Bless you. Yes. Give, everybody, give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you.